Welcome to Salon Talks. I am Mary Elizabeth Williams, and this fashionable person is Lucy Boynton. You know her from a lifetime of incredible performances in movies, ranging from ballet shoes to Bohemian Rhapsody to shows like The Politician. And now she's in this incredible, lush, beautiful, exciting, dramatic new movie playing Marie Antoinette and it's called Chevalier. Hi, Lucy. How Hi. are you? Good. Thank you so much for having me. So this is a story I knew nothing about. Mm -hmm. I can't believe there is this important story that I'd never heard about in my life. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about how you found out this story and how you got involved with this project. Um, I mean, I thought when I first read you know, the brief of the script that I had never heard of Joseph Bologna before and then realized that he is who I've read referred to as Black Mozart. Um, and that was a kind of the catalyst for conversation between myself and the director, Stephen Williams, for how many people that must, that does happen to um, when your name is erased because you're compared to your male or white counterpart. Um, and so instantly I was intrigued there isn't a huge amount of information out there, so this script was a uh, kind of the main resource for understanding who Joseph was. Um, and most of all, it was just like a really interesting brand new take on that era that otherwise we're quite familiar with in terms of like the French Revolution and Versailles, but, but no, from this very new angle, and, and he was a kind of rock star of that age, so it was fascinating. And you, I mean, when you talk about the things we know about that era, but there are things we get so wrong about that yeah. era, too. And you are playing one of the most iconic, yet also misunderstood, maligned women in history. Mm. How did you approach playing her? It was interesting because I think I had a really specific preconceived idea of her when going into this. and when I approached the script, I wondered how they were going to frame her because I wanted, I questioned if we needed a voice like hers right now. Um, and then was, yeah, yeah, kind of ashamed that I had had um, this narrow view of her um, and this very misunderstood view of her. So I started the research from kind of throwing all of that out the door and starting from scratch, reading it as broadly as I could, trying to kind of reach from every different resource and then started shaving away at what would be most useful for this tone of the film and her as a vehicle in it specifically. Um, and it became kind of two different channels because there's one where you really start to understand the context for this person when you realize how young she was, for example, when she entered the French court, she was 14 when she was married into that world. Um, and it was completely foreign to her, but she had this kind of rebellious streak to her where she would reject the rules and the status quo as was. So she was really intriguing, and I think the main impression of her is so informed and so importantly informed by her context. However, then for this film, it's a really specific set of circumstances, and it is visiting a much darker side of her when the walls are closing in and she's she starts to clutch to these principles that previously she would have rejected and turned her nose up at. Now those are the things offering safety. So she kind of betrays herself and that's kind of how she settled on the wrong side of history. But, but it was interesting and I think had she been villainized for the things that she does in this film, he would have really understood it and it would be just. But yeah, um, the, way, the kind of reputation she's had based predominantly on a quote that is incorrectly attributed to her is kind of wild and I think um, another reminder as this film is to to really question the sources and the history books and and the way we've been delivered information about these people. Right and who gets to tell the stories. And who gets to tell the stories which you know frames people like Cara Zavillan and erases people like Joseph Bologna entirely. Yeah and this is such a and I love that because she's she's not She's not rede it's not a, a redemption arc for her, but it's no. about her being complicated yeah, and flawed in her own way as a human. Yeah, and I think, if anything, it's just understanding you can only begin to, di to kind of analyze and um, dissect someone's behavior if you do the same with the context of who they are, who they've been, and their environment. There's no point in kind of doing it in isolation. So it was a really good reminder of that and a really good exercise in doing that but but yeah then ultimately I kind of it was more important I think to me to utilize this opportunity to 
really drive the message of that character rather than being staying too accurate or trying to um, honor her in any way. Mm -hmm. It was more important to kind of uh, yeah honor the film. So that's why we've got a villain on our hands in this film, <laughs> which is fun for you. It's not your first. Uh, it's not playing that. I want to ask you before we talk about some of your other roles. The look of this film, the atmosphere of it, the costumes, oh, the yeah. wigs. Oh, you yeah. are a fashion person. You have been a Chanel ambassador. You are you are fashion, 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 fashion. You and I want to ask how you played this role with those costumes, with those wigs. How that informed who you became as her. It completely informs it and I think that's why the costuming process in this job is really why I've, how I've understood fashion more and how I've enjoyed it more because you realize it's an opportunity to, um, to you know, express yourself or alter that. So create an elevated or different version of yourself and show a different side. And so I love doing that with characters and I think with Marie Antoinette it was such an enticing experience, the costuming process, because she's someone who very much believed in more is more is more when it came to decorating oneself. And she was like the first woman to work with a stylist, as we'd know them now. Um, and it says, I mean, you know, she was so aware of how many eyes were on her at all times. And I think she became, she wanted to make sure that she was a kind of a co-author in people's perception of her. So that is very much informed by the way that she presented herself, um, whatever that says about the message she's trying to get across. Um, and, and yeah, and that tells a huge story about her in itself. So it was a, a real education diving into it, but also just so satisfying and exciting getting to step into those costumes and the sheer extravagance of it all and the new kind of space that you take up both width and height. I was going to say horizontally and yeah. vertically. There were a lot of close calls with some flames on that set. Yeah. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I Especially bet. when that much hairspray is involved, it's There's a walking a, risk. It's an extremely flammable It is. Situation. The just propulsion of, of the flames could go yeah. everywhere. Yeah. This is something that you've used in, in roles before. I, you know, I read an interview with you where you talked about how you came up at a time in your career, in, in an era when the, the pinnacle of acting in the UK was to be in some posh BBC kind of period drama. And you have done your share, and you have done your share of period dramas, and like, you've been in a lot of corsets. Yeah. How does too that, many. How, well, when you say too many, how does that then affect how you are perceived? as an actor, the kind of roles that you get maybe sent out on, mm. and the choices that you make doing uh, zagging and doing things like The Politician. Mm. It's a really interesting question. I think, um, yeah, I think it's very easy to then be seen in that world or, or of that kind of thing, so it is then really satisfying. I mean, this job is one where you get to constantly then make a sharp plot twist left turn and do a contemporary horror film or something like The Politician where you get to keep people on their toes not knowing what to expect but I really enjoy that and I mean I really love doing period pieces I think one of the elements that I love the most about this job is the transportative nature of it and the kind of the fact that it's like the most tangible um, version of time travel um, and you get a kind of behind the scenes history lesson when you do these period pieces and it's just so thrilling get to, getting to exit your life and your identity so completely when you're surrounded by, you know, the walls of Versailles instead of South East London. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, I kind of, I think I want to continue doing all of those period pieces, but, but throwing in a few surprises here and there. The walls of Versailles, the Orient Express. What? It's been some great sets. Where, you know, London in the 70s, whatever yeah. it, wherever it may be. Another, when you talk about things that you're attracted to, you are you are like one of the go-to horror icons too, and specifically like period horror. You like not just horror, but like horror in a bodice. Yeah. What? Like I can't think of any other actor who's done that that as much as you. What is it about horror that you are so attracted to? And did you have a horror movie that? set you off? Not really, because I don't love watching them, I have to say. I mean, I love the the like classic, classic horror films like, I mean, Rosemary's Baby, Shining, Psycho. Um, 
when it is this kind of psychological building of fear, so from the very beginning, you instill in the audience this feeling of being unsettled. Um, I think that's so much fun because also the process of, of making a horror film becomes really analytical because you're more than, I think, any other genre, you're specifically tuning into what the audience will be experiencing scene to scene um, and being, I think, more manipulative of that. Um, but I, 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 I love a kind of gothic horror genre because I think, you know, it's, I can't remember who said it, but it's a quote of, you can speak to any issue if you dress it up in genre. So it's a really effective vehicle to be able to Trojan horse a really impactful message. But also there's an element of, you know, growing up as a woman in this world, there's a certain level of fear of not being able to, you know, walk along the street alone after dark. And so there's something really satisfying then about being the source of fear in these films where you for once are the kind of catalyst for these things. And there's a really unique sense of the tables being turned and of power in that. That sounds really dark, but I find that just really interesting. Well, it is really dark, Lucy. Let's I know. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to that back and be like, oh, okay, that was revealing. Like, Lucy's then. spooky. Yeah. Uh, Lucy mm -hmm. is a spooky lady. Save what, that one for therapists. <laughs> that's what we've learned about you. But it's interesting, and I think it's very insightful. And it also speaks to something I heard you say recently about how you've changed as an actor since COVID, mm -hmm. and that the pandemic and being in lockdown made you a bolder and more confident performer. That's an interesting self-insight. Yeah. How did that come about? Because because I have to say, the pandemic didn't make all of us bolder and more right. confident. Yeah, and in many ways didn't for me either. But in that department, I don't know. I think it was, you know, spending so much time just with, just speaking, other than like the odd Zoom here and there, it was like just speaking to people in a, in a really colloquial way, people you're very close to, family and friends and loved ones. So suddenly this layer of like, decorum or hierarchy was removed and even just being not being on set for an extended period kind of reset me in a way so then when I got back on set yeah I realized I was speaking to my director in a much more candid way and in a way less dictated by this hierarchy that I've projected onto the environment um, and especially having grown up since a kid on in these kind of sets I think I had really carried that through this sense of hierarchy and I, yeah, suddenly caught myself, and obviously not like in a rude way, but just in a way that was much more bold and and kind of taking authorship and ownership of myself and my character a lot more. Uh, and so I was kind of surprised and pleased with that. And I think it's just like getting older as well and, and feeling more, It's yeah, that thing of feeling more kind of ownership over, the, of, over your job and your role in those characters. Well, it's clear you've done a lot of thinking and rethinking about your career. You also, you started as a child actor, then you took a break for a couple of years mm -hmm. and came back into it. What was it that made you decide, yes, I re you, you wanted to take that time to be a teenager, to go to school. What made you decide, yeah, I want to come back to it. And then realizing when you come back to it, you're in a different yeah. space as an actor. I think, I th yeah, and it was not my choice at the time. It was my parents and my teachers making me take time off to finish my exams, which now I'm grateful for. At the time, less so. Um, I think looking back on it, it meant that just kind of what you're saying, if I had to find out for myself what I was craving, why I was missing it, what elements, and what I needed from the job and, and what I get from the job, um, and I'm, and I'm sure that changed because as a kid, I did kind of a few roles in very quick succession and loved it. Whereas when I went back when I was 18 and was really auditioning again, it was work and it was much more analytical um, and self-aware. And, and I realized that I needed it. And I think if you don't need it, then it's a really hard industry to keep pushing through with all those like and the endless rejection and the endless way you have to not take anything personally, pull yourself up and just keep learning, doing better and all, yeah, and just keep, keep at it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for that time and, and, and coming back as an adult was very different and also just for the fact that my awkward teenagers didn't have to end up on camera, really thrilled about that. Well played. And when you talk about it being a hard industry, it's also a hard industry, I would imagine, for someone who describes himself as a private person. You have said uh, 
in more than one interview, the less you know about me, the better. Yep. Uh, which I gotta say, thank you. I love a challenge to prepare. I love to prepare oh, an interview for someone who says the yeah, less you sorry. know about me, the better. <laughs> but I want to ask, like, how do you balance that? How do you create those boundaries for yourself, especially with the English press being what it is? It's hard mm. to be a private person. How do you do it, Lucy? I think I don't know. I think it comes. I mean, I'm instinctively a private person, so it's not so much that I have to try and remind myself or find ways to do it. It's just the, uh, it's actually the other way around if I have to find ways that I'm able to push the boat out and yeah, and be more open. Um, and more than anything, it just made sense to me because this job, with this job, the less you know about me, the more you're able to believe the characters and just take them as they are, rather than seeing, you know, Lucy dressing up as and with these kind of affectations. So, so it, feels counterproductive to put so much of myself out there. Um, and obviously it's a huge part of the job like this, just being able to tell people about Chevalier and talk about it in depth is um, a genuine privilege. So I understand that side of it. But um, but yeah, I don't know. I think it's just finding the balance of making sure that the conversations are mainly about the work so that the work can be the thing that that kind of is at the forefront and shines so that I can keep doing it, hopefully. Well, I love the work. I love this movie. I want to ask you about one more project because you have another. You do a lot of music adjacent. I know. Like where it's you're in, becoming a theme in movies or projects where there's music. Yeah. Maybe you're not singing and dancing. Yeah. You have another one coming out. Yes, soon. Tell the me greatest a bit about hits. That. Yeah. So the greatest hits is written and directed by Ned Benson, and it is a kind of meditation on our relationship with mus between music and memory and the way that music can be so transportative and sentimental and link you to these points in your past or certain people. Um, and so my character Harriet is transported by music to um, being to a loved one who she's lost. Um, and it was just such, I was sitting with the director the other night and, it was just, and we were reminiscing about the whole experience. It was such a special, um, like enriching process. It's one of those that, you know, forces you to analyze your own relationship with these things, like your sentimental relationship with music and how that plays into your own life. So it was just, it was fascinating. So yeah, that's another Searchlight movie, which I'm very lucky to be working with them again. And we've got a killer soundtrack. So I'm really excited to, to share it with everyone. All right, well, I'm looking forward to that. But in the meantime, I might just have to watch Chevalier again because yeah, I feel like there that. was so much detail. Yeah. Yes. I need I need to look at it again with fresh eyes. So yeah. just go and you need to see it on the big screen. Go see Chevalier. Go yeah. see it twice even. Yeah, do that. Lucy, Buy two tickets. Lucy Boynton, thank you so much for thank talking you. to me. And congratulations on Chevalier. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.